Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. For the next hour, your hosts will go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam, the provocateur. Alrighty, Cam, what are we looking at this week? We are going to have a look at the 1965 spy thriller, The Ipcris File, starring Michael Caine and directed by Sidney J. Fury. Now, one of my favorite things to do every week is to read you the synopsis from letterbox.com. Do you want to take a bet now on how how long it is? I could see this one being super convoluted, but um, I'm going to guess because it's an older movie, it's like half a sentence. (laughs) Well, sit yourself down. And prepare, because here it is. The Ipcris File, the spy story of the century. Sly and dry intelligence agent Harry Palmer is tasked with investigating British intelligence security, which is soon enmeshed in a world of double dealing, kidnap and murder when he finds a traitor operating at the heart of the Secret Service. Wow, Done. that's it? I, I'm especially impressed with the use of sly and dry as a description of that character. I, I was just like looking at the word enmeshed and like, oh, I don't think I've ever actually said that word aloud before. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stunned they didn't use the term trickster as they did in the movie, which made me laugh. Yeah, I, uh, to be fair though, I do like the concise you know, brevity, clarity, straight to the point. When I think of the word trickster, though, I think of Loki from, like, the Thor movies. I don't think of Michael Caine in the Icarus file. <laughs> no, he doesn't really strike me as uh, the kind of guy to walk around with a giant scepter and the uh, uh, <laughs> thorns on his crown. <laughs> well, maybe on weekends, just not on duty. <laughs> hey, there are sequels, and I haven't seen them, so maybe he does. That would be amazing if by the time we get to Billion Dollar Braid, he's walking around in a cape and a horned helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Just mind-controlling people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, this took a turn, Cam. This took a turn. <laughs> but I'm, I'm along for the ride. <laughs> We're in now. We can't stop. So, I, so, if I remember correctly, is this your first time seeing this film, Cam? It is indeed, yeah. So, what were your initial thoughts? Um, I was really excited about tackling this franchise because when we started Spy Hearts, obviously a big part of the appeal for me was getting to talk about movies like North by Northwest or, you know, revisit stuff like The Bourne Identity, which I hadn't watched in forever. Um, But I I was also looking forward to new discoveries. And The Ipcris File, I'd heard a lot about, and I was very aware of the Harry Palmer character, mostly because a few years ago, I don't know, maybe it was 10 years ago. Who knows? Time just flies by nowadays. But uh, Michael Caine started a movie called Harry Brown, which was about a former intelligence operative who gets involved in like kind of a personal drama. And there was a lot of references in reviews for Harry Brown about Harry Palmer. And so I suddenly began to realize that this was a thing, but I never saw the Harry Palmer movies. So I was excited to dive in. And I got to say off this first one, I'm super in. Like I thought this movie was really cool. Okay. I actually, I'm on the other side of that one again. I, well, I hadn't seen it. So this again was my first entry to it, but I didn't really know much about this film at all. I'd never really heard of it. I'm not really familiar with Michael Caine's earlier work, except for maybe the Italian job or or Zulu, something like that. Um, But I wasn't a big fan of this film after watching it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you on the early Michael Caine. I'd seen The Italian Job and I'd seen Alfie, but not a lot else. Um, A lot of them aren't super available here in North America, the way they are maybe over there. Yeah, you tend to find things like uh, Italian Job, probably Alfie, tends to get played a lot on daytime television here. Right. Just, Just because it's been around so long, they're just British staple films. Right. Well, that's interesting, though, that we've got a little bit of a a disagreement. I think this is the first real time on the podcast. I'm down. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's the first one I've actually been a bit sour on just watching. Right. But before we get into sort of more in-depth look into my thoughts and your thoughts, can you give me any background on the film? Yes. So this movie was a special project by Harry Saltzman. Harry Saltzman is one of the producers of the Bond franchise. It was him and Cubby Broccoli that launched Dr. No!, And Harry Saltzman saw this as the anti-Bond franchise. 
something he could create that would take away kind of the trappings of James Bond, the glorified settings, the over-the-top action, the cartoonish characters, and really strip it down to lean, mean espionage tales. And so when he decided to get this going, he recruited a lot of the people from the Bond franchise. He brought in editor Peter R. Hunt, who edited Goldfinger, Thunderball, a lot of the early Bonds. He also directed Honor Majesty's Secret Service. He also brought in production designer Ken Adam, who did You Only Live Twice and Thunderball, a lot of the big, big Bond movies where they have these enormous sets. Um, he also did the um, submarine layer in The Spy Who Loved Me. Um, they also brought over art director Peter Merton, who worked on Thunderball and Goldfinger and would go on to work on The Man with the Golden Gun. And of course, John Barry came on to do the music. John Barry decided James Bond utilized guitar. So Harry Palmer, I'm going to use the Symbolom. Now, Scott, do you know what the Symbolom is? Now, for those who don't know at home, I'm a bit of a multi-instrumentalist. I play a lot of instruments, but I have no idea what that is. Yeah, I don't think the Symbolom has held up to the modern day. I don't think you're hearing Taylor Swift play the Symbolom in her uh, albums. Okay. <laughs> it's basically, oh boy, it's tough for me to explain, but it's sort of like a uh, box. I think it's maybe a trapezoid, maybe, but it's like a box with like strings inside of the box. Right. And is it played like a, more like a harp? I think so, yeah. I don't think you could like hold, you could not hold this box in your arms. I think you'd have to have it laying down and be pulling the strings like that. Oh, so sort of more like a slide guitar, but, but plucked. I think so, yeah. That is a strange instrument. So this was, that was the main instrument used for this then? Yeah, and so this may have been a big deal in the 60s, that type of instrument. I don't think it's one that has really carried on too strongly. Maybe it's a little bit like the theremin, because the theremin isn't really used a lot nowadays, but in the 1950s, they used it a lot for sci-fi movies. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll have you know, all of my multi-instruments I have are different types of theremin. That's all I play. <laughs> Scott has a PhD in theremin. <laughs> <laughs> Doctorate, I think you'll find. Doctorate. <laughs> so Harry Seltzman decided to recruit uh, director Sidney J. Fury, who was actually a Canadian director. So we've got some British and some Canadian in this one. Is the Ip Chris File the second greatest British-Canadian collaboration, Scott? Wait, what's the first? Why, that would be the Spy Hearts podcast. <laughs> well, I missed that one completely, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't think anyone at home uh, thought that either. <laughs> no. <laughs> they were like, oh, right, okay. Oh, yeah, sure. oh, oh, that, right. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> but Sidney J. Fury is interesting because he has a pretty extensive filmography, but not a lot of note. I was going through all of his earlier films to try to find some sort of link, maybe work with Michael Caine or something. Uh, no, he seems to just mostly be a, you know, workman-like director who just worked a lot, cranked out a lot of movies. Not a lot that are remembered. Um, some things he did do that have had a bit of a legacy, for better or worse. Um, he did do a movie called The Naked Runner with Frank Sinatra, which is an espionage movie that I've added to our list. So maybe we'll cover that one day. Um, he also did Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. The all-time great, of course. Of course. He did the Rodney Dangerfield movie Ladybugs, which was very popular when I was a kid. Can't say I'm aware of that one. Okay. And he was also the mastermind behind the Iron Eagle franchise. He wrote them all and directed Iron Eagle 2 and 4. Did he also write the theme tune? I don't know. Um, yeah, and he played it on the theremin. <laughs> exactly, that's what I was leading to. <laughs> uh, I, Sidney... I would know, I'm the doctor here. <laughs> but Sidney J. Fury actually was only available to do this movie because he turned down A Hard Day's Night. Oh. Yeah. Bad choice, buddy. That film's great. <laughs> Yeah. So, now, I, quick question before you jump into the next bit. Um, yeah. You mentioned before, obviously, this has got this uh, sort of cast of behind the scenes of lots of Bond staff. Mm -hmm. Where does this fall in the Bond chronology? Which ones have come out so far? Because obviously, if this is meant to be the sort of anti-Bond in a right. way, what are they answering just to help people at home? Because I and myself, to be fair. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they would have put out Dr. No and From Russia with Love, 
Goldfinger probably would have been done if not in theaters when they would have been rolling on this one. Okay, so two of the strongest Sean Connery ones are already out in people's minds. So I can see, yes, this would make more sense now as an anti version of that. Okay. Right. And this opened the same year as Thunderball. So it was sort of a little bit of not competition, but they had kind of the dueling um, Harry Saltzman productions that year. Understood. Yeah. And so the movie was based on a novel by Len Dayton um, that was written in 1962, or at least published in 1962, I should say. Um, And the writers of the movie were kind of guys who didn't do much of anything. Um, One of them is a writer, W.H. Canaway, who was actually a novelist. He only had like one other credit, which is a movie called A Boy Ten Feet Tall, starring Edward G. Robinson. Otherwise, he just wrote novels, which were basically historical adventures. Um, The other writer was a guy named James Doran, who wrote a lot of TV, a lot, but no other real movies. So both of them were sort of a a one-time entry into the film world. Yeah, basically. And for the actors considered for Harry Palmer, Michael Caine was not number one. Um, Some of the others considered were Harry H. Corbett, Ian Bannon. Do you know who those people are, Scott? Because I've never heard those names. I'm probably letting the rest of the Brits down on this one, but no, I have no idea who those people are. Yeah, I feel like they were working actors at the time that just have not crossed over, didn't really get big breaks. So I'm not familiar with either of them. But the other two that were up for the role were Richard Harris and Christopher Plummer. Christopher Plummer was the number one pick they wanted. Now that name I know. Yeah. Christopher Plummer chose The Sound of Music instead. Another wise choice. Well, no, that was a wise choice. The one before was not. (laughs) Um, Michael Caine ultimately got the role because of his work in Zulu. But at this point, Michael Caine wasn't a big name. This was the movie that actually launched him. That was going to be my question. Though. I, where did this fall in the chronology of, of Michael Caine's work? So, okay, right. he'd done Zulu. That makes sense. Yeah. And Michael Caine had a quote about Harry Palmer. He said, James Bond is Clark Kent after he says Shazam. He is Superman. Real spies are Clark Kent all the time. So you get a sense of what they were going for with this movie. Now, is, is Michael Caine conflating two superheroes there, or is that actually what Superman used to do? I don't think Michael Caine is a big comic book reader, because, yeah, he's confusing Superman with Shazam, a.k.a. Captain Marvel. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's, that's what I had in my head. Yeah. Fine. Uh, so, apparently the production on this movie was a nightmare, and Sidney J. Fury and Harry Saltzman clashed super bad. Like, there was constant fights... Sidney J. Fury stormed off the set a couple times, and ultimately he was banned from post-production and from the Cannes uh, Festival screening party, and he claims that Harry Saltzman also stole his British Academy Award. <laughs> what? You That's theft. You can't just get away with sort of accusing someone of that without proof. <laughs> I love that fact. That made me laugh so hard. <laughs> Okay, all right. This is, uh, this is probably setting up my feelings on the film already, but go on. You get a sense now why Sidney J. Fury did not direct the sequels. That was going to be a follow-up question I had was, is he tied into the future ones? But obviously not. No, he doesn't. So this movie, though, was massively successful. Um, it played the Cannes Film Festival in May of 1965 and was nominated for the Palme d'Or, which is the big prize for the festival. It didn't win, but it was nominated. It went on to open in theaters and it had a budget of 7.4 million US and that's adjusted for inflation. At the time, it was like way less, obviously. And um, the box office, um, it did adjusted 72.4 and that's domestic. That's not worldwide, that's domestic because as I said, when we did um, North by Northwest, it's very hard to track down worldwide box office numbers for movies that opened before the you know mid to late 70s because movies opened at such different times internationally versus domestic and some of them didn't open for a couple years. And then there was revival screenings all over the place. So the money just was always getting added, but it's tough to track down an actual year for earlier movies. But that was the case, 72.4, just domestic. And they talk about how this movie was like a massive hit over in Britain. So I would guess that it did incredibly well there. It's certainly a film that's popped up uh, in the background of my life, I've seen it as it, I've seen it, the cover art before for, for sure, but it's, I, as I'd never seen it myself, but um, I didn't realize it was so popular. Maybe I'm the weird one. 
Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, they said there was like lines to get into this movie for quite a while. And um, for when you look at the top three of that year, I've looked at, I've got the top three domestic, but I am almost positive that this is very representative of what the top three was worldwide from what I've been able to find. So the number one movie was The Sound of Music, which was a juggernaut. So Christopher Plummer walked out a winner for sure. Um, number two was Dr. Zhivago, another massive hit. And number three was Thunderball, also a massive, massive hit. And, and this came in number four? Um, no, this was further down the list. Like, if you're looking at the U.S., it's down at like 20 or something like that. Like, the numbers get very hazy. But um, I think just it was huge over in Britain and maybe other sections of Europe. Um, reasonably successful it, over here. Like, it was a hit for sure. And there was no way this thing wasn't getting sequels. But it wasn't like the biggest hit of the year or anything domestically over, over here in North America. Like, for example, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold with Richard Burton did better domestically than, than um, The Ipcris File did over here. So it gets you a sense. It was definitely a hit. It was definitely popular, but it wasn't like a barn burner of a uh, box office you know, player. I mean, my opinions aside, 7 million budget adjusted for inflation against making 70-odd in just domestic alone yeah that's a tenfold return that's that's pretty damn successful Um, oh yeah uh, studios would love that these days exactly like this movie really i mean when you're looking at 72.4 profit that's great and the movie was actually honored a lot over in britain at the uh, 1966 bafta awards it won best british film best art direction and best cinematography and it was nominated for best actor and screenplay the movie was also nominated for a Director's Guild of America nomination for Best Director for Sidney J. Fury. And it has since been listed as number 59 on the BFI list of 100 Best British Films of the 20th Century. See, I'm starting to worry now that this is when the listeners think that I'm just not very good at uh, reviewing films. Because apparently everyone who actually means anything really liked this film. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently you're not a member of the British Film Institute. <laughs> Well, I, I can confirm that is true. <laughs> you, your write-in vote just kept going for Johnny English too. <laughs> no, it, it's all it's all Men in Black International, right? And the response was, "These aren't twentieth-century films." <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't wrap my head around it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I feel pretty stupid now. That's probably a good time to move on. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> that kind of wraps up the background on the Ipcris file. So a movie that, like, I don't, I can't say it's had a huge footprint over, at least on my side of the pond, but there's obviously a lot there. And this movie was hugely influential in the 60s. Did you say your side of the bond? Oh, I did now. <laughs> hey, yeah. Um, if it was influential in terms of, you know, fans of the films in the 60s, Maybe. I don't know. But it, as I say, it never really made its way into my viewing collection or anything like that. I can't say I was particularly aware of the film apart from just seeing it here and there. Right. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I'm letting down the rest of the United Kingdom by ba- barely acknowledging it. I don't know. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so what was it about the movie that didn't grab you? I, I could I could spend a while deconstructing why I didn't like it. But like the the... The general overview was by going for like an anti-Bond, which I actually wrote that down in my notes, it was like an anti-Bond film. It took all the fun out of it for me. Mm-hmm. And I understand, it, you know, not all films are going to be full of jokes, even though this did have some jokes in it. And uh, Michael Caine is quite funny in the film. I just found the story to be a slightly confusing story. And... I didn't really care about anyone. It is very chilly. Like, it is a cold movie. Bond has a little more of that romanticism and a more of a sense of just having fun, whereas this was almost like, we are not having fun, people. It, it kind of reminds me of, like, say something like Downton Abbey, for instance. Uh, for those not familiar, it's a popular British TV show about old times in, in England. Uh, that show is quite popular in North America. Uh, a lot of people here look at that show and just sort of think, ugh, 
how like humdrum why do we care about this and maybe it's the sense of that sort of british dryness to it that i i like maybe i prefer the sort of bombastic approach that the bond films take because i as a kid i would always look at american media and sort of want that style whereas i wouldn't like watching a lot of british shows like i struggle with watching older british stuff like old doctor who for instance right that's interesting because i was going to ask you as a brit if you found the james bond franchise like does it feel british or does it feel like american filmmaking kind of putting up a wallpaper of britishness versus this movie which feels very british at least to me i'd say it's probably the latter of those two Uh, the bond films feel like they have that I, i use the word bombastic i guess i'll stick to that word but um there's a lot going on and there's jokes and there's action and there's all sorts of things whereas the the biggest action scene in this film is shot through a phone box i love that action sequence <laughs> oh. well, don't get me wrong i understand why this won an award for cinematography i get why it won an award for art direction but i maybe i just don't like that sort of film I just thought, like, why can't I see their faces? That they're not even like punching each other. He just pushed them down the stairs. Well, that's like I, a real fight. I've that's seen what, that... well, I've seen real fights outside the Royal Albert Hall, and they were more action than that. You and I can restage that fight when I come to visit at some point. I'll push you down the stairs anytime. <laughs> you know what? We should just do a photo op of us pushing each other down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> the security were like, oh, they're just uh, just doing the Ipcris file thing again, aren't they? Yeah. I would love it if security actually said that. <laughs> <laughs> Just walk up and go, Ipquis file. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I didn't 100%. get that film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for my part, it's really interesting in that a lot of what you pulled you out of the movie was what I really loved about it, which was just how cold and remote this thing was. I really liked how it was this enigmatic look at this spy world doing very James Bondy things, but in a way that was so stripped down and like chilly. I love, you know, there's a moment um, early in the movie where Harry Palmer goes in and they're giving him a new gun. And like this scene plays out very similar to a scene in Dr. No, where Bond is getting his Walter PPK, but he goes in and there's like, a moment where he walks over and he like flips a switch and you're expecting a gadget and it's nothing happens. He walks over. There's just like a inventor tech guy, basically just at a drill, a very standard drill. He gives him like a Colt gun. He's like, ah, you know how to use this? And Harry's just like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Like it's very unflashy. And I felt that that kind of worked for the movie where it was these spies who kind of work in the shadows. It had that sort of a British sort of punchline where he goes, oh, I prefer the old whatever gun it was. And then the, the boss, uh, who was it at the time? Was it Dolby in the room with him? Uh, yeah, Major. I believe so, yeah. And he goes, he goes, no, you're using this. And then Harry Palmer says, I guess I'm using this. And that was it. I was like, okay. Yeah, the humor okay. is very understated. Very understated. It, it's, it's, I mean, you look at, say, James Bond, and he's very well-spoken, well-kept. And then you look at Harry Palmer, he's got the Cockney accent that uh, Michael Caine likes to use in basically all of his films, <laughs> uh, which I like to try and imitate whenever I can. So this will be coming back. Don't worry. Sure. Um, but yeah, maybe that just didn't, didn't help it for me. Well, maybe that's a way to dive into this conversation a little further. It's just the comparisons between James Bond and Harry Palmer. I mean, even the names are very different. One is very like working class kind of name versus James Bond has a real flash and flair to it. It reminds me of your uh, Canadian born identity name. Oh, was it like Paul something? Paul, um, I can't remember the last name, but it was something very boring. Oh, Paul K. Paul K, that's it. So Harry Palmer is the, the British Paul K. Yeah, he kind of is, yeah. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't really have... He has the sort of suits he kind of wears from time to time, but he hasn't got the tuxes or anything like that. No flashy gadgets. I suppose he gets the girl. He does have the womanizing thing going as well. Like that is consistent between him and Bond, but that's about it. I mean, Harry Palmer, I kind of laughed about the opening credits of this movie. You know, you look at the Bond opening credits. It's these big, to borrow your word, bombastic openings with music and amazing visuals and they're very like sexy and exotic and strange 
whereas this opens with like Harry Palmer making breakfast. <laughs> It's just grinding coffee and then reading in the newspaper as the music slowly plays. Nothing else is going on. And then you think of like the opening of Dr. No and he's, he's playing back her and James Bond. And yeah, <laughs> completely different opening. And you have scenes where Harry Palmer's grocery shopping. Multiple scenes. <laughs> I mean, I do all of my spy meetings in Safeway shops, which are, it's an old British chain that's now defunct. But it was nice to see that, I suppose. I never realized that I desperately wanted to see a scene where a spy meets with his boss at a grocery store and complain about mushrooms. And then like, aggressive cart hitting. Aggressive cart hitting, complaints about this American way of grocery shopping. <laughs> and then, you know, it's trying to be serious. And then the, the, the lady goes to ask, he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, pardon me. And I love when the boss like grabs a can and says, beef arena. He's like, Beefarino. <laughs> I just that weird bit where Ross grabs a little canister and then Palmer says, Oh, that's kids' food, and then just puts it back down again. Like, yeah. It's a choice, I guess. I took multiple notes about that scene. That's how much I love that scene. <laughs> uh, I, I do wish, and there's something this film reminded me of, because this film is, is very old school British. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people around that like these people anymore and the way they talk, and the way they act with each other. But I wish more people said good day or good morning at the end of sentences. Oh, okay. Right. It doesn't happen anymore. I just, I, I do think like, oh, that's a nice way to finish a sentence. <laughs> it's, a, it's really nice punctuation. Like, I'm done with you. Good day. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'd be down for that. But I did love just how much they grounded Harry Palmer in a recognizable reality. Like, you don't see James Bond occupying the types of places that Harry Palmer does. Everything he does is very generic. Um, you know, he goes to a library to encounter the villain. Um, he's just walking the streets a lot. He's not dressed particularly flashy. He's definitely not that charismatic a presence. He's just kind of a boring dude doing legwork, as he says. Yeah, and I, I, one thing I'll give, I'll tip my hat to the film, is geographically, it's mostly correct. Oh, I really? mean, the, the Science Museum is around the corner from the Royal Albert Hall. So he could well have followed him out and walked up to the Royal Albert Hall. And that, that all follows through. The park is next to it as well, where they do the meeting later on for the, uh, the band, I believe, but that might be the other one. Which is, oh, and by the way, park watch people. There, there's two parks in this film. There is uh, Hyde Park with the Serpentine, I think. And then there's also uh, Kennington Park in Oval. And I've been to both of them. So I know you're keeping this at home. Just note those ones down. When I go over there, we have to do an Ipcris file tour. <laughs> I know all of those bits very well. I, I could take you on a very quick tour because they're basically <laughs> on top of each other. So did the character of Harry Palmer grab you at all? Like watching this character, following him for two hours? I'm going to be honest, not particularly. I think that may have been where the ultimate failure it was for me. Mm -hmm. Which I wouldn't say is a failure of the film. Maybe it's a failure of me to appreciate it. But I, I know many, many Cockney people like that. And I draw a sense of humor. I, mean, I don't know any spies as far as I'm aware, but then maybe that makes some good spies. Maybe I know loads. Right. But um, I just didn't find him particularly interesting because I... It's not a new thing to me. I know tons of people like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in your defense, I have read several reviews. Um, after I watched the movie, I went and looked up some of the criticism. And there are a lot of modern critics that aren't as responsive to this movie because of how kind of threadbare the characters are. There's not a lot there. And a lot of them don't seem to be particularly... Um, enjoyable characters to spend a lot of time with. Um, for me, I was more drawn in just by how kind of cool the atmosphere was and how detached they were. Like, I actually found how detached they were to be really entertaining. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, we spoke about it, I think it was in a couple of episodes ago with the Men in Black, how me and you are very much a work to live people. Mm -hmm. Harry Palmer is a work to live kind of guy. Yeah, this is not the jet-setting guy who's giving up his entire life for the cause. I mean, he was basically recruited because he was facing potential prison time. So he's not really the guy who's there because he necessarily loves it. But, you know, you look at James Bond's apartment, which we've seen a couple times now. It's not particularly well-decorated at all. In fact, it's fairly sparse. 
Um, Harry Palmer's place is much more homey. Like you can tell it's a guy who takes pride in where he lives and has the time to decorate. And cook. He loves cooking. This man loves cooking. He buys the French, uh, French fancy mushrooms. Now, I know we've seen Bond cook. Only once is jumping to mind. I'm remembering in A View to a Kill, he makes quiche for Tanya Roberts' character, but I don't think he cooks any other time that I can recall. I mean, it seems like a that's one of those anti-Bond moves, is to make him a cook. Because it, it shows that he actually has a passion that's not to do with spycraft. Right. Like he has a hobby. Yeah, he definitely does. And he seems to be very good at it. And he cooks to Mozart music, which I thought was pretty entertaining. And he says, I'm going to cook you the best meal of your life. And then the next scene, it's the best meal I've ever had. Okay. <laughs> I will say that love interest is just dead weight. Like there is nothing coming out of that character. It could have been anyone. Yeah. So I'm I mean, sorry to Sue Lloyd, who played the character of, of Courtney. Courtney. Weirdly pronounced name. But um, yeah, nothing there. Yeah. I mean, that's a character that's introduced just to have some sex appeal and the relationship between the two of them kind of give it a little bit of a spark of romance. But I mean, this is real perfunctory stuff. You know, you can talk about maybe how problematic some of the Bond girls are in the 60s era, especially, but they're given a lot more to do on screen than what she gets to do. I will give her, not, well, actually, I won't give her credit, I suppose, but she is part of the scene of one of the, my favorite shots of the film okay. that I made a note of. It's when he's entering his apartment and he looks through the, I think it's a keyhole he looks through and he sees the gun barrel. And then they open through the, the key hole and then to the barrel of the gun, it peels back and she's just sat on the chair looking at the gun. Right, yeah. There's some amazing camera shots in this movie. I was actually really blown away by just the direction of it. Sidney J. Fury picks a lot of very strange camera angles, a lot of looking down on characters from high like heights, also looking up at them a lot from low angles mm -hmm. where you're basically looking up their nose. He does that a lot. Um, you know, you referenced the fight earlier um, by, uh, Roy, was it Royal Albert Hall? Um, That's right, on, yeah. On the steps. And he frames things in very weird ways. He's also really big on expansive spaces. There's a lot of scenes where characters are in warehouses or factories. And he shoots like the entire factory. And the actor is like basically just like a small little fragment of the frame. He also does this thing, I, I, there's probably a cinematography name for it, but where the, the scene's like wonky to one side a lot. Oh, like Dutch angles, yeah. Right, okay, yeah. That, that seems to be half of the shots were done that way. That was a big thing in the 60s. Um, they used it a lot on the Adam West Batman show in scenes with the villains because they wanted to show the villains were crooked. Is that literally why they used it? Because that is on the nose. Yeah, that was why they used it. They just thought it'd be a fun visual language approach to the villains. But you've seen it, uh, you know, it does pop up here and there. Actually, Kenneth Branagh used that technique quite a bit in his Thor movie, in the first Chris Hemsworth movie. I have to say, I think I've seen that film once in the cinema. Hmm. It didn't, didn't really stick with me, that one, unfortunately. I enjoy the first Thor. I think it's uh, maybe my... It's, I'm not going to say it's the best of the three, but it's the one I've revisited the most. As in it, the introduction movies for Marvel, do you mean? What do you mean in the introduction? Like, as, as the first films? I thought you meant, like, Captain America First Avenger or, like, the, the introduction films, like Iron Man. Oh, no, no. Right. Although, right. although, you know what? Out of those introduction films, I think I've watched Thor the most of those two. So <laughs> make of that what you will. Okay. Well, I suppose we're getting off topic with, with the Thor thing, but I would have thought your most watched Thor would have been the last one. I enjoyed it, but I wasn't as blown away by it as a lot of other people. I thought it was fine. More of a Dark World kind of guy? No, it's better than Dark World. Dark World's the, among the worst of the Marvel movies, for sure. It's up there. Yeah. But um, with Harry Palmer, then, he's obviously our lead of the film. I'm not saying I didn't like him at all. I wasn't completely cold to him. I, I appreciate his sort of sarcastic view on things, because I tend to do the same, especially in moments of pressure or intense emotion or anything like that. I will sort of resort to sarcasm. Maybe that's just the, the, the British knee-jerk reaction. Right. Uh, but I, I appreciated that, that, especially when he's dealing with the Major Dolby or Colonel Ross, that slightly 
he's trying to slide the barbs underneath the radar. What did you think of those bosses, those characters? Um, I've met people similar to both, I would say. Although I didn't really understand Colonel Ross until right towards the end of the film. I didn't know what he was going for. I understood Major Dolby until obviously the twist. He was just sort of a no-nonsense, get-the-job-done sort of boss. I loved Major Dolby. I was almost heartbroken when he turned out to be the villain because I love that character. And I was like, please, God, let this be his boss in the next two movies. I I literally wrote down two quotes of of his that I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I've heard that before. Uh, Well, actually, no, I haven't heard this first one, but I'll bite you, Palmer. I'll bite you so hard. I've never had a boss tell me they're going to bite me before, but... uh, (laughs) And then what was the other one? Oh, just at the end of a rousing speech, well, not even a rousing speech, but like a, a meeting with all of his staff, he just goes, all right, get on with it. I love too, there's a, a factory that Harry calls, I don't remember what the code is, like a 221 or something, where they go and break through the doors because they think that this missing scientist that they're looking for um, named uh, Radcliffe is potentially at that factory. And basically they all come storming in. There's no one there. And Harry Palmer says to, uh, to uh, Dalby, he says, you know, I would have been a hero if he was here. And Dalby says, he wasn't and you're not. <laughs> just so matter of fact, just nope. But then he follows it up with saying, come on, I'm going to buy you all lunch. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. this character. <laughs> the, the one bit of joy he shows in the film is when he's listening to the... Uh the red line music and then the, the Mozart afterwards. That, apart from that, he's a completely joyless character, I would say. But I loved him. He was so <laughs> joyless that I found him fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I want my Dolby spinoff. <laughs> well, I don't think... You might get a prequel one day. You never know. I will take it. Um, but you are right. Like, um, Ross, I didn't have a good grasp on at all. And I think that's intentional. They want you to question whether that character is evil the whole time. Um, or at least once suspicions are raised. He's he's fine. Like, Guy uh, Dolman plays that character. Nigel Green plays Major Dolby. Uh, MVP, Nigel Green. But, uh, yeah, Guy Dolman plays that character of Ross. It's just very matter-of-fact, um, a little bit of a temper, but he's not a particularly fun character. I found Dolby fun, whereas Ross is just matter-of-fact. And I'm just curious now if Ross is a continuing thread in the sequels. Yeah, I have a feeling he'll be sort of the boss that doles out the mission, sort of the M of the operation. You don't think they'll do a Mission Impossible and just swap out bosses every movie? Mm, I mean, they spent a lot of time building him up. I, I mean, to be fair, a lot of films have done that and then just thrown away the character in the sequel. But I don't know, I, I would think they would have brought him back. I, I would assume Guy Dolman's somewhat of a known actor at the time. Right. I would guess also these movies were shot pretty much back to back, like one per year for three years. So right. my guess is that a lot of the cast and locations will just carry over. But you're right, though. I probably would have liked to have seen more of Major Dolby overall, the two of them. At least it was more interesting and, and kind of funny in like a standing back and watching them do it sort of way. Were you heartbroken with, when he was exposed as a traitor? As a, in, in sort of a now I'm looking at it, I am more heartbroken about it. I didn't really <laughs> feel much at the time, I have to admit. Weep with me, Scott. Weep with me. (laughs) Listen to me. Listen to me. (laughs) What did you think of the villain of this movie, Blue Jay, played by Frank uh, Gatliff? In reference to Blue Jay, I think he's also known as, his actual name is Grant B. I just wrote down, not much of a villain. But was that intentional? Because when you look at the Bond movies that have come out at that point, you've got Red Grant, You've got um, um, Dr. No, you've got Goldfinger, you've got Rosa Klebb. Doesn't this character feel like the anti-Bond villain of just so boring? But who wants that? (laughs) Me! (laughs) I want boring! Give me boring! (laughs) It reminds me of the bad guy from North by Northwest. Right. He's just sort of there, operating. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I mean, he's definitely the type of villain, though. You could just see at the grocery store, for example, or just walking along the street, sitting in a library. I kind of like this very low-key approach to evil spies. 
if you just compare it to some some of like the the Bond villains, and then you just think if they got say they got mugged on the street, mm-hmm. they would pull out a gun and kill the guy mugging them. Oh I, yeah, I could I could see Blue Jay or Grumpy, I should say, just like getting beaten up, his wallet taken, and just kind of shuffling home with his head hung. Right. Like, well, that seems like a bit of a sad sack to me. That's why he had that House Martin character who was kind of his thug, who I was surprised was dispatched very quickly. Yeah, another weird thing. You, you think, obviously, there's that little fight scene outside the Albert Hall, which seems to be our favourite thing to keep coming back to, because it's the thing I, I probably hated the most in this film. Um, <laughs> even though you loved it. He's dead in the police cell ten minutes later. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they're just subverting a lot of what you expect from... I'm sure that James Bond movies had trained people to expect from these types of movies. It seemed like they were going out of their way to always not give you that, which I kind of found very <laughs> impressive. See, I, I understand subverting expectation. Uh, and sometimes that works. Uh, you look at like The Last Jedi, I think they did a lot of subverting expectation really well. Mm-hmm. I just feel like this one subverted it in a way to just make it boring. Like they took all the fun stuff out of spy movies for me. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's definitely true. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> I th- this is this is the ultimate uh the the point I wrote literally right at the end. I wrote down the Ipcrez's file. Oh wow, who would have guessed? <laughs> I'm letting down a nation right now, I think. I'm I'm I, I'm not sorry for it actually. I, I'm gonna stick to my guns. This film what? bored me. I'm so sorry. Flags are going to be flying at half mast in Britain tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to wake up and they like graffitied my house and for, for an exit and everything. Hannah's going to be harassed in the streets. It's going to be horrible. <laughs> um, one thing, you know, again, differentiating this from the Bond movies, I thought was interesting was when Harry Palmer is captured in this movie, and we should say a lot of the plot is very mysterious, although I actually found it easier to track than some of the Bond plots, but a bunch of scientists have been going missing and. Radcliffe is the, you know, the one who's gone missing at the start of the movie. He's recovered, but he's not all there. Ultimately, Harry Palmer is kidnapped by the villains, and we get a sense of what their scheme is, which is brainwashing. And I thought this brainwashing stuff was amazing. What did you think of Harry's A, imprisonment, but also B, the brainwashing? The imprisonment bit I quite enjoyed because it, it was actually a, a bit of a departure from how the rest of the film was going. It felt like there was actually something going on. Hmm. Uh, obviously, he's being he's being tortured and such in a way, marking the days down. He's keeping himself awake, and the reveal afterwards. Also, I I, I noted as something I quite enjoyed. I didn't see it coming. I thought he was in Albania, so it did genuinely surprise me that he was in basically Knightsbridge. Yeah, that actually surprised me as well because I also thought he was in Albania. I was curious. I had one question. Maybe you picked up on it. I couldn't quite get it. So the way they're torturing him is they're keeping him freezing in a cell. They're waking him up a lot. But there's a thing with them starving him where they send him bread that's like sitting in water or something and he never touches it. What was going on there? I couldn't quite get it. I, I did actually watch this film a second time. So maybe yeah. that's why I'm so bitter about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, from what I could make out, because I did make a point to try and look at that again, I think they fried the bread in hot oil. So it's actually like oil at the bottom. So when you're trying to grab it, it, it's very hot bread. Or you might just about get the bread, but you wouldn't get the the plate or anything like that. That makes a lot of sense because I was thinking it was water and I was thinking boiling water. But then I was like, this doesn't really make sense to me. I don't get what's going on. It would just make the bread wet. It It wouldn't cook it if it was just water. Whereas oil, you'd actually get like a toasty sort of bread. Right. Okay. So yeah, that's what I took from it anyway. Okay, that actually answers my question. But I thought this whole sequence was really strong of him basically trying to keep his sanity, carving the days into the wall. I mean, Harry Palmer's imprisoned for minimum 12 days in this movie. That would never happen to Bond. You know, you look at Dr. No, where he's locked in a cell, you know, during that movie when he's kidnapped. He's out of that cell in about 30 seconds and up in the vents. I mean, he does have sort of the Bond escape where he beats up the, the goons and makes, makes a way. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it takes 12 days of him being brainwashed, having to hurt himself, bleeding, starving, growing a beard out. Like, he looks bad. He's and how, And how unflashy is his escape? It's the unflashiest. It's, it's how we would escape, I imagine, apart from maybe actually overpowering two people. He, like, slowly walks across a courtyard and just, like, shimmies over a fence. Yeah. 
I meant to ask you, I, I meant to sort of follow up to your question before. You mentioned about the brainwashing itself, which you quite enjoyed. Yeah. I'm not saying you want to be brainwashed, but um, did you get sort of a Clockwork Orange vibe from that one? I think I've mentioned Clockwork Orange again. It might be two episodes in a row now, but that whole stimulus overload thing going on. Well, this predates Clockwork Orange, but um, ah. I, I would say there is a very strong aspect of 60s psychedelia. And mm. we haven't touched on that much actually so far in our you know, journey on this podcast. We will be getting into it a lot <laughs> in some movies coming up in the future, both good and bad. But this was a very real thing in the 60s. And it's the one moment I felt like this movie's very chilly and icy throughout. But then you hit this sequence and suddenly that 60s vibrancy and psychedelia and colors and weird visuals really come to the forefront. And I enjoyed how they kind of held back on that for so long. This whole kind of swinging London 60s psychedelia vibe. And then they hit you with it in this brainwashing sequence. I thought that was really effective. I mean, they are making a point to actually, yeah, you're right. Not pay attention to all the stuff that's happening in London at that time. Mm -hmm. Because it's quite a colorful city at that point. Not in this movie. No, it's just blue. Yeah, and sort of like that dingy gray, just it looks very matter of fact, yeah. It just looks it looks lived in and real, which I think is I guess is what they were going for. It uh, yeah, totally. And I mean I thought the brainwashing sequences were super effective. I thought they were just really memorable. And it's not like he overpowers it with his amazing psyche. He's just using a physical thing he's been taught to overcome that sort of stimuli, which is hurting himself. Yeah, and that's something he goes to a few times, which is, you know, poking himself with a nail, or there's a moment at the end where um, Ross and Dolby both show up. He doesn't quite know which one's the bad guy yet, but Dolby reveals himself to be the bad guy. And we get this, like, over-the-shoulder shot of Harry Palmer's gun going back and forth between the two guys as Palmer's ordering him to kill Ross using the hypnotic techniques that will basically mess with Harry's mind. And his way of breaking that is to punch like some sharp metal to cut himself so that he's able to gun down Dolby. And I thought that was really effective as well. I actually didn't pick up on it the first time I watched the film. I couldn't figure out how he understood it was Dolby apart from the fact that Dolby said the sort of trigger phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really see that quick cut of him sort of slicing his hand on the camera or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, only on the second watching I picked up on that it, again it's a, sort of a nice through line they kept that going it is and I'm very curious like what did you think about the brainwashing being kind of the core of this movie for the villain plot like did it seem goofy to you not really because it wasn't like they were brainwashing people to you know think of like Zoolander right when they're doing that over the top brainwashing sequence to try and get him to assassinate some dignitary or something like that right if I remember that film correctly, which I shouldn't be. Because brainwashing is a thing we're going to be tackling quite a bit, I think, on this podcast. You know, Manchurian Candidate, that'll be an element of that. Also, as you know, On Her Majesty's Secret Service has a whole brainwashing hypnosis element to it as well. It's something that was very much in the air, I guess, in 1960s. There's probably a reason for that, which I'm sure we could do some research and find out why it was in the sort of zeitgeist at the time. I'm wondering if the Russians were experimenting with brainwashing at the time. I'll do a little bit of research for when we do Manchurian Candidate. We'll get back to you guys. Yeah, that'll be a little bit down the road. But I'll be curious how you uh, enjoy that film in comparison, say, to this one, which is similar themes, but done very differently. I mean, I, I, I take the mickey out of this film. I think it does the brainwashing bit fine because it's subtle. It's maybe what brainwashing could actually theoretically do. Right. Which make you forget your past or slight suggestions and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I was sort of getting to before. And so I think that was done really well. To yeah. Your question. I thought like for a movie that keeps you a little bit on tender hooks throughout waiting to find out what sort of the villain plot is, because the villain is just hanging around libraries. <laughs> He's not the most um, <laughs> showy of villains. But when you actually get the payoff as to what the plot is, I found it interesting and the payoff strong enough that I could completely justify the build up for it. Yeah. And I would say I'm not a big fan of, of Grant B as a villain. I think he was just sort of there to sort of carry it through, but Dolby, when you break it down, I think is a much better villain. 
I agree. And I mean, what even, what even happens to Grantby? I think he gets away. I think so. Which is kind of weird as well. It's, again, very um, not a Bond thing that would happen of the villain. Just The villain's not even mentioned. He just kind of disappears and you don't hear him mentioned ever again. You, you would probably get a scene of like Bond turning up to dinner where he's eating and taking him out or something like that. Like a follow-up scene at the end of the film. Right. Or Bond would be on a train with um, the Sue Lloyd character, Courtney, and um, Grampy would show up, you know, dressed as a maitre d'. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, I, I know we mentioned briefly about uh, Courtney's character, Sue Lloyd's character, Courtney, I should say. But I, it annoyed that there is a distinct lack of female representation in this film. You know, when we started this podcast, that was something I became very aware of um, because I put together a master list. This is some behind the scenes for people listening. Um, I have a master list of spy films for us to go to. And that was something I began to realize was that a lot of these movies are very dude centric. Um, the Bond movies obviously have their female leads in there, but a lot of spy movies are kind of like the, the business of men, if you will. And I, I have no problem with films trying to be somewhat factual to the era they were set in. Mm-hmm. And if you, I imagine most people operating as spies at this time, it was mostly a, a male, uh, predominantly male area of, of work, I would say. But there's lots of other things that women could have been doing in this film. But instead, you get a bland love interest. And then the only other woman character, as far as I remember, is the naggy receptionist lady. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are other women that just kind of pop in, but they're mostly just there so Harry Palmer can stare really creepily at them. Oh, yes. Like, I think he's walking through the corridor and he says, oh, have a good evening, too, or something like that. Yeah. He has a very weird approach in that, like, Bond has his little quips or his humor. Whereas Harry Palmer just stares women down. It's very weird. Yeah. Uh, I'll add that to my list of gripes about the film. I don't think we mentioned it. I know we're sort of trailing back to Harry Palmer a second, but it's, it sprung to my mind. He has the same backstory as Napoleon Solo. Yeah, it's very similar, isn't it? Mm. Was Man From Uncle a British production or was it an American production? It was American, but we also don't know... The backstory for Napoleon Solo that was given in the movie, we don't know if that applies to the show. I don't know that it does. That's true. We didn't watch that far into it. Yeah. Getting back to the moments that sort of subvert Bond tropes, I really enjoyed the introduction of the CIA agent, who's the Felix Leiter character, if you will, who's this dude with glasses that just kind of shows up uh, in the background of a scene or two and then dies. Like, there's no relationship there. Harry Palmer has no idea who this guy is. He's one of those characters I lost track of in my first viewing and I had to find out what happened to him. And I only realized that Harry Palmer shot him in that car park. Well, did he? Or was that actually Dolby? I don't know now. You've got... Wait, wasn't it Harry Palmer? Well, I don't know because Harry Palmer is being framed. So I'm always, I was a little unclear on that after the fact. It seems like it's Harry Palmer that kills him, but it wouldn't shock me if Dolby was the one that shot him. I don't really know. I mean, I might have fallen asleep twice and missed it. I may be wrong. So uh, maybe I need a second watch as well. But you, you did bring me on to a, a thing I did want to mention, just another gripe with the film, uh, which is the other American agent, mm-hmm. uh, Barney, which is played by Thomas Baptiste. The only major scene he has where he says any words, basically. Harry Palmer is in the sort of auditorium with uh, Dr. Radcliffe and a bunch of scientists and this agent. Now, Harry Palmer is scanning the room, I guess, for some reason, uh, to make sure the address goes well or something. And then obviously Dr. Radcliffe has a breakdown. Now, Harry Palmer spots Barney in the crowd. He's the only one smoking a pipe, but he also happens to be the only black person in the crowd. Is that why Harry Palmer looked at him? If this were a movie now, I might say there's maybe some more subtext or something there. But this being a 1965 film, uh, I think we have to assume the uncomfortable. Yeah, this is something I noticed in my second watch through. I didn't really pay attention that much in the first one to little things like this. But then I, it just made me feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. He, he, it does, it's not like, because then he also does the weird thing of running away while everyone else runs to Dr. Radcliffe. If, that's been, if that had been where they cut to him noticing him, it would have been fine. It wouldn't have been an issue at all. Right. But the only reason he notices Barney in the crowd is because he's black. That seemed to be the case to me as well. 
Um, I think we have to accept that the Ipcris file, not very good uh, towards women or minorities. Evidently. Yeah. One other thing, though, I'll bring up, kind of my last point that I really enjoyed about this movie, was um, that uh, how drab the headquarters are. You know, when you look at the Bond movies, the uh, Secret Service offices, you know, with Monty Penny as the secretary and the padded door and then M's office, it's all very luxurious. I loved how drab and ugly all the locations were for the offices. You know, they have one of them set up at the Dolby Domestic Employment uh, Bureau, which is the most like ramshackle, almost depressing building with the secretary that just kind of looks almost like a chain smoker and just kind of, you know, totally not a Monty Penny friendly type. Um, and this just extends across all the scenarios that are professional in this movie. I loved when he goes to his surveillance job at the start and it's this like, just like this flop house with like girls pinned to the walls and it's just super ugly looking. I liked how all this, the workspaces in this movie looked hideous. Yeah, I mean, it, it has this sense of nitty gritty realism that I, I think this film has stuck to all the way through from sets to just the story itself. And I think that that is a strength of the film, that it does keep to it. I didn't really enjoy it, but at least it sticks to its guns. Fair enough. I guess I have one question for you, though, mm -hmm. um, because we've got two more Harry Palmer films to go. From this point of just having watched The Ipcris File, what do you hope to see in the future movies that maybe you didn't get in this one? That's a very good question. Maybe the only thing that would draw me in a bit more, because I don't think they're going to... I don't think they're going to start leaning into the camp side of spy films. I don't think that stuff's going to make its way in. I think they're going to try and stay grounded in realism. So just maybe more of an enticing story. Right. Which I think is fair enough. This is definitely a very um, kind of aloof, almost uninvolving story, but almost intentionally so. Yeah, it just feels like you're reading a, a factual dossier on an actual thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like a, you're watching a reenactment of a actual thing that happened. Right. That's fair enough. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just mention. I do want to give major props to Major Dolby as a man who also has a, a curly mustache. Yeah. His, his mustache game is on point. And for those wondering at home, I have a full on uh, lockdown beard at the moment, but my mustache is twirling at the end. So kudos to Dolby because we're in, we're in sync with our mustaches. I am entirely in favor of Major Dolby being our mascot going forward. He's everything I want to be as a leader, apart from evil. He's everything I want to be as a man. <laughs> you saying you couldn't grow that beard if you tried? No, I couldn't. No, not a chance. Uh, I would like to see you with facial hair. I don't think I've ever seen you with like, anything other than stubble. Yeah, it's not pretty. Okay. Oh, you haven't seen my beard. <laughs> and I had a question for you. Yeah. So would you say that you spent enough time in the film with the brainwashing scenes to get an idea of what it feels like to be brainwashed? I would say so, yes. I think it did a really good job um, playing out these imprisonment sequences and then also, um, you know, the horrors of being in this box with all these images and sounds around you. I think it did a really good job making you feel how uncomfortable it is because I think a lot of movies, when they have hypnosis stuff they make it kind of fun and colorful whereas this had this really shrill tone on the soundtrack that was unpleasant to listen to you could understand sort of the torment that harry was going through in that moment so i'm gonna do a little science experiment then uh -oh. okay this is for everyone listening at home all right listen to me listen to me you're all going to subscribe to this podcast and give it a five-star rating on every single app you can find and then tell all your friends to listen. Thanks. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> good plug, good plug. Yeah, you've got to try, you know. I am curious, though. If the villain in this is Blue Jay and all the other villains are named after birds, what is your bird name? Tit. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, what about yourself? Blue-footed booby. Why did we both go with, like, booby jokes? I don't know. <laughs> wow. That's telling, <laughs> listeners. That is telling. I just went with the funniest bird name I could come up with off the top of my head, and that was where I went. I didn't even make the connection. <laughs> uh, 
We have mammary glands on the brain, apparently. Uh, okay, well, I guess, Scott, that does raise a fascinating question this week of, does the Ipcris file make the knock list? <laughs> I was afraid of this question. <laughs> I don't want to answer this question. I'm going to leave the podcast. Okay, no, my actual answer. Did I enjoy the film? No. Will I watch it again? No. Is it a good spy film that highlights a particular area of the spy genre? Maybe. And that's my dilemma coming away from it. I, I don't necessarily have to enjoy these films to think they are a good spy film. Right. I'm trying to be sort of constructive with my criticism in a sense. And I, I, I know what I didn't like, and that's fine. But it doesn't mean that it isn't a good example of this version of a spy film, which is sort of ultra-grounded like Craig era of Bond without some of the Bond trappings. Mm -hmm. Um, So before I give my full answer, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. This is a tough one because like so far in the lead up to this movie, all the episodes we've done are movies I know, if not um, super well, at least know them fairly well or have a real sense of their legacy. Um, Whereas I stand a little bit at a disadvantage with this one in that I... I'm very aware that the Harry Palmer movies are very important. Um, You know, obviously it launched Michael Caine. Um, These movies have, I think, more of a footprint internationally than they do where I live in North America. North America, these movies are pretty obscure, really. Um, You can't even really find affordable copies to buy on Amazon, for example. They're not streaming on iTunes. They're not really that available. And so it's hard for me to say easy in because of the legacy of this franchise. I'm very, I get think just be by being a North American, a little, I have less of a grasp on what the legacy is. I will say though, as a spy film, I did find it engrossing. I found it a really interesting alternate take on kind of a pulp spy hero, very different than James Bond. Um, I'm really interested to see how this franchise evolves. I enjoyed the hell out of watching it. So in terms of being like a, an engrossing spy film that I really found entertaining and fairly iconic in moments and just had a lot of imagination going for it and in, in a very offbeat approach to the spy formula, I would say yes, but I can also, like, I think there's wiggle room on this one. Wiggle room in what sense? There's some wiggle room on whether it makes it in. Like, when we did North by Northwest, I felt very, very strongly that North by Northwest really belonged on that list. Whereas this one, having only seen it once, also being a little bit removed from the impact this movie's had, I'm a little more up in the air as to whether it's a definitive, this belongs in the canon versus this is a really fun movie I enjoyed that I think was really great and people should check out. But is it an all-time spy movie? That's where I stand a little bit, I guess, uh, a little bit of a question mark over me. I suppose it's a sense of, I know there's two more of these films and then there was two sort of TV movies they did as well. Yeah. A part of me is almost interested to sort of see if the next ones improve on the bits I have problems with so that it makes a, a more of a, an easier yes for me. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm debating with. But then it, I could, by saying no, for instance, run the gambit of the follow-ups being just worse films. You know, look at the Men in Black franchise. Sure, yeah. I mean, my answer would be a yes for this one. Um, But it's not like an emphatic yes. If I go with yes, this is the second time that we've initially disagreed and you've sort of taken me onto your side. Right. Um, I'm not... hmm. As I said in the beginning bit of the knock list, I didn't like the film personally. It's not something I'd want to revisit, but I'm aware that this is a, a bit of a touchstone in the spy genre right? for a lot of people. And I'm not blind to that fact. It just might not have suited my particular tastes. I mean, I liked Men in Black. Right. And you didn't, as a kid, you didn't like it. So we obviously have different tastes. Right. I think I'm going to go with yes, but it is a very, very loose yes. Yeah. It is a little bit of a tough call because I feel like we're both fairly removed and this movie, what the impacts it's had haven't aged as well like is that a question that we meet that we maybe need to grapple with a little bit too is that obviously some of these movies we're going to take on have aged incredibly well 
and others maybe haven't. Has this movie not aged as well as, say, those early Bonds or North by Northwest, which are shot around the same time? I think this film is, is very grounded in the date that it's, it's set. Yeah. This does feel like 1965, whereas I think you could apply a lot of the Bond films to now and you could more or less get by. So yeah, there's a lot, some of the sci-fi elements and stuff like that. Yeah, there's some, you know, racial things or gender things that are a little uncomfortable with some of the old Bonds, but the stories translate quite well still. Ultimately, I don't feel safe in rolling the dice on the follow-up films. Right. So I'm going to give this a yes with a massive asterisk next to it. Okay, fair enough. I I can't take it back. I realized by saying yes, it's on the list. It's canon. It's set. But I think more people will probably enjoy this film than me being the one who didn't like it. And judging by all the awards it won, I I think I'm probably on the bad side of history. Right. So, I mean, I think it's a little bit conflicted for both of us for different reasons. One, you know, for you, it's because you just didn't enjoy kind of the experience of watching this movie. Whereas for me, it's being somewhat removed from the legacy of what this movie is. Like, I understand... 100% why North by Northwest is important within the the world of cinema. Whereas The Ipcris File, I feel a little more removed from. And so that's where I think I struggle because because some of them I'm not necessarily like a massive lover of those, of movies we're going to do in the future. But I understand historically why they're important and belong on the canon and people should really watch them. Whereas this one, I feel like, I enjoyed the hell out of watching it, but I also don't know that it's vital that everyone check it out. I don't really know. And you said it a couple of episodes ago, actually, and and this just rung back in my head. The knock list is an additional thing. Yeah. It's separate from my opinion on the film. Right. And and that's how I'm trying to come at it. So that's why I'm giving it the yes. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't recommend people to go and watch this as like a Sunday afternoon film. I, don't, right. I didn't find it enjoyable. You, you may have recommended some of your friends to go watch it, yeah. uh, but I, I couldn't do it. But if, if someone comes to me and says, Scott, give me 10 great spy films. Currently, we have four on the list. I'd have to give him this. A conflicted yes is still a yes, ultimately. So yeah, we'll put the Ipcris file in the knock list. And hopefully we're not proven foolish when we watch the sequels. Yeah, uh, hopefully it wasn't too much of a gamble. Uh, but there you go. So just to clarify, then it's a yes and yes. Yep. So there we have it. The Ipcris file is officially on the knock list. And with that revelation, the dossier on the Ipcris file is complete and filed as classified. And if you want to track the knock list, jump on over to letterbox.com slash spyhards. We will have basically a visual representation of what the knock list is. You can check it out there, as well as listings of the movies that didn't make the knock list and just all the movies we've done. So head over there and you can engage with us and argue back and forth about whether something did or didn't belong on the knock list. I have a feeling they'll be arguing with me about this week's episode. Well, we'll see. (laughs) Cam, what are we tackling next week? We are going to have a real change of pace. Um, I guess if going from Hannah to the Ipcris file wasn't a change of pace, this one is a real head spinner. We are going to take on the 1984 family espionage film Cloak and Dagger starring Henry Thomas and Dabney Coleman. I think a lot of people sort of in my generation, you know, born around 1980, have some familiarity with this movie. So I think this will be a fun one to revisit it. And uh, I haven't seen it since I was like a real young kid. So this is going to be a fun experience. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of those films I saw and in the background and I never really knew the film title. It's just something that was on at one point. But I, from looking at stills, I don't seem to recall it. So it may be a first watch for me. Okay, listeners, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Cloak and Dagger before next week's episode. But don't forget to follow us, discreetly, of course, on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, good luck. Among the Shadows.